Okay, so this is the uh, Colonel Internship Report uh, for the outreach Outreachy Interns. Um, my name is Julia Lewall. I was the coordinator for the Linux Kernel at some point in the past and also briefly, um, I guess about one year ago. The normal uh, coordinator is named Allison Schofield, but she was not able to come. I'll put her contact up information up later if you want to see how you can help participate in, in, in outreach in the future. Um, so the other speakers we'll have here are Hans, who will be giving the perspective of a maintainer, and Tahera, who's a former intern, and also Dorcas, who's a former intern, and there's another former intern that we'll hear from, but unfortunately she was not able to come, so we'll have her on video. Uh, so first I want to just talk a bit about what is Outreachy, what is the program. Um, so this is something that originated with um, GNOME, I believe in, we've got Karen here, so she, yeah, I was going to say two finals in 2010, I wasn't completely sure. Um, it used to be called Outreachy, Outward Outreach Program for Women. Um, the, it was a goal to expand the focus and then so the name was changed to Outreachy. Um, the goal, the original goal was to get more women involved in open source, and as I said, the goal has expanded to other underrepresented groups. Um, internships are for three months. Uh, they pay fairly well for internships, which is $7,000 per, um, for the duration of the three months. Uh, the interns are paired with a mentor, or often two mentors sometimes. Um, and then work closely with the mentor during the entire internship. It's obvious it's a remote internship though, so basically people meet once a week or so and on video meetings, exchange by email and so on. Uh, so there are two rounds of internships per year. One of them is in the May to August time, so traditional summer vacation kind of for Northern Hemisphere people. And there's also December to March, which is in principle vacation time for people somewhere in the world, um, but I, I should stress that Outreachy doesn't focus only on students. It's open to anyone over the age of 18, um, so anyone who would like to, or anyone who satisfies these other criteria, uh, anyone who would like to get into open source, it's a way to get in. Um, this year, in the most recent past, there were 21 organizations involved, uh, so the Linux kernel is just one of them. There are many other organizations very well-known organizations and things you might never have heard of but are probably doing interesting things as well. Um, so the original motivation was, as I mentioned, the low female participation in open source and in particular um, an observation about Google Summer of Code, which is also another intern remote internship program, which is that no women had applied to GNOME for Google Summer of Code. So there was some feeling that maybe uh, women in general just feeling like Google Summer of Code is not for them. Um, and so there's a goal of trying to make a um, internship program that would target people who maybe didn't feel welcome elsewhere. Uh, so I looked up some more recent numbers about the prevalence of women in open source. So this is a issue that is still with us. Uh, this is a paper from the Mining Software Repositories Conference, which is a conference where people study different aspects of open of software development uh, with a lot of emphasis on open source. And so some people took 17 projects in 17 different programming languages. Um, basically, they picked 17 languages and then found highly ranked projects in each of those languages. Um, and they found that female contributors were less up to 7.5%, except for, very strangely, there was a Fortran project where the participation was like 21%, but maybe it was from a small number of contributors, I don't know. Like one out of five is actually 20%, but it's um, not a great number. Um, and then they did actually some other analyses about what are these female contributors actually doing. Um, and they also found that the ratio of coding to non-coding contributions is smaller for uh, female contributors, so maybe they found that con female women were contributing to documentation or something like that and not so much to actual code. And also um, they found that female contributors consistently make fewer commits across all task categories with very large disparity in contributions to security related tasks. So I have the um, impression that their conclusion was that maybe in the most prestigious or most important 
aspects of the software, the women were still somehow not feeling like they could contribute. Um, but as I mentioned, Outreachy has branched out from uh, only accepting women. Today, Outreachy invites people who face systematic bias or discrimination in the technology industry of their country. Um, so there's an attempt to, uh, is it like a very careful attempt to assess uh, people make actual applications. They describe how, how they are effect, may be affected by bias in their particular country. It's like a local situation. And there's actual manual process of studying these applications and assessing the situations. Um, so it's quite flexible as to what the kinds of issues people can have. Um, uh, and then there's a, outreach expresses, expressly invites applicants who are women, trans men, and non-binary people, and genderqueer people to apply. But still, these are not the only um, kinds of people who apply. I've, I recently met someone uh, who worked on Linux kernel a few years ago who has a hearing issue. And so that's completely disjoint from this kind of gender-based um, direction. Um, people must be, able, must be able to work full-time. There's no half-time internships in Aoichi. Um, the work is done remotely, and as I mentioned before, there's no need to be a student. Um, so if you know someone who is interested in getting into open source and who fits these other criteria, then please encourage them to apply. Um, I think some of the people that I have helped with outreach in some way who have somehow been the most proud of their achievements were people who had some job and then they found that job not so interesting and they wanted to move on to something else. And in Linux kernel, we've had a number of people who have followed that path and got a job after their internships that they found more interesting or better pathway for growth and things like that. Um, so application process, it's now in two parts. The first part is a one-week period where you submit a preliminary application and express your um, interest in the program, why you believe you're eligible, background, and so on. Um, and then those are studied over a period, a certain amount of time, and people who are eligible are then invited to um, participate in a four-week contribution period. And during that time, you are working with um, developers in the project that you're interested in, and um, the goal is to make some kind of contribution to that project. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a big, intellectually demanding project contribution. The goal is not to do the internship. The internship happens during the internship. The goal is to understand the processes of your community so that you can be able to contribute to it from day one. So if you are contributors to Linux kernel, you know there's a lot of ramp up stuff in how do you format a patch, who do you talk to, how do you express yourself, and so on. And so we try to get that stuff out of the way um, during the first four weeks um, so that the intern is operational immediately when the internship starts. Um, so concrete, they work for it. We have a tutorial that has evolved over many years um, and clean up, basically clean up staging drivers. Um, so just basic uh, kernel contribution tasks. Um, and then applicants complete an application based on what they did during the application period and then they are selected for the various projects. Uh, so some of these projects, uh, some of them we will hear about today. Um, Tahara will be talking about Landlock, um, another project at the same time, or no, sorry, a few months before, um, Sumya Negi worked on uh, I-915, and at the same time Dorcas worked on uh, the media subsystem. Uh, there will be also the talk from, from basically one year ago from Khadija about um, uh, analyzing Linux security subsystems, and then Previous projects I have given just a list here. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, cleanups. I, I think you see a pro improving a lot. So uh, these internships are also kind of the opportunity for maintainers if they see some kind of maybe not too complicated task, but a bit more work than they want to put into it at the particular moment. It's the opportunity to have a human who will focus on that and. Um, maybe that will continue with the project afterwards in the future. Um, so that leads us also to what happens to these interns when they're done with their projects. Um, 
I think ideally, of course, your intern would then devote the rest of their life to working on your project um, and become a, uh, you know, take over your job as maintainer of some code that, or something like that. Um, that's not particularly realistic. Um, they have to find some kind of paid work usually so that they can eat and continue to exist. Um, some of the former interns have actually gotten kernel facing positions. Um, a nice example is Carolina Starelek, who was an intern in 2021. And so not only did she get a job at Intel working on DRM, and so continuing to contribute to Linux kernel, she also mm -hmm. became a mentor as well. Um, so not only giving back to the community, also giving back to Aoichi. Um, several interns from 2022 um, got jobs at Intel and Calabra, respectively. Um, some other interns I know from years past have gotten jobs at Google, Meta, AWS, Oracle, Calabra. These were not always like right after their internship. They were not always kernel-facing positions. Um, I would like to think that um, Maybe the goal of the kernel community is that interns, if we invest in interns, they will stay in the kernel community and we will have more women and underrepresented minorities in the kernel, which would be wonderful. But on the other hand, I think it's also important that women and underrepresented minorities just continue to exist and be visible and do whatever they find interesting in the tech industry. Um, and so some of these people have gone on to work in things like AI, cryptography, all different fields, uh, whatever fields was of interest to them. Um, but I am very uh, proud and impressed by the, the different positions that people have gone and the career paths that they have forged after Outreachy. I don't know if Outreachy, how much Outreachy can take credit for all of this, um, but it's still a very nice thing. And others have continued their education. Um, some uh, master's degrees, PhDs, and so on. Again, not always right after their internship. They may go off and do something else for a while and then realize that they want to um, get some more understanding of the field and move on and so on. Uh, so how can you help? If you are in a company, maybe you can influence your company to contribute. Um, <laughs> um, so an uh, intern receives $7,000, but an uh, intern costs around $8,000. This provides some funding to the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy to help manage the program, especially uh, evaluating a lot of those applications. It's very important to find the best applicants, but it also takes a great deal of effort. Um, so that's a, a great help. Um, if you have your company has something to offer, you can contact this email address or just Google for Outreachy and then you can find all the relevant information. Um, and then you can also in a more informal way for the kernel reviewing patches, volunteering as mentors, and if you're interested in either of those things, then you can contact Allison. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, so now Hans will tell us about mentoring and then we will hear from the interns. Okay, um, thank you for coming. My name is Hans Verkau. I am uh, one of the two co-maintainers of the media subsystem. Uh, uh, this was, Dorcas was my third outreach intern that I mentored. I've also mentored uh, a few from the Linux kernel mentorship program and quite a few Cisco st uh, summer students. Uh, quite a few are now my colleagues. Uh, so this is a little bit about how I mentor. I basically use the same method for all of these because they're all very similar. You all have a task and you have pe find people who want to do that and you mentor them. Some practicalities for Outreachy. Uh, these are my experiences. It may differ from for different, different mentors, of course. Uh, my expectation is that you roughly need about 10 days for the full project. That includes all, also the application period figuring out what good projects are, uh, the reviews, the mentoring, and it's spread out over the whole period. Uh, personally, I always have a co-mentor because you know you can get sick, uh, you might want to go on vacation, uh, some other things might crop up. The co-mentor generally doesn't, uh, the main thing is that they are CC'd on the emails, 
uh, see the chats and participate in the video chats that I personally always have once a week. Otherwise, they do not need to have need to be involved that much. They just need to follow and know the state and they can jump in if something happens. Uh, I usually use email. That's anything that is not immediately urgent. Uh, IRC or use some other chat system for the more interactive things. And a weekly video chat. It's nice to actually talk to the person, uh, see how glossy their eyes are, whether they actually understood anything. Uh, it, it helps to have that visual aspect. I think as a mentor it's important that you quite quickly reply to questions because otherwise the, the, the intern is often stuck. You know, if you don't simply don't know how to do something and they don't get the information, um, how do they proceed? Uh, if you know that you're away for a few days or vacation or whatever, make sure they know that in advance and organize the work around it. Um, time zones. So this door cause it was easy or two hours difference or something. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, I've also had an intern where it was nine hours difference. And that's kind of the maximum that I think you can do. I'm not sure if I could mentor someone where it's 12 hours difference. And even with nine hours, you really, she has started a bit earlier. I went on a bit later. So you have about one to two hours where you're both uh, working and you can answer the questions. Um, so you, you do need to take that into account. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that for the first point. So it's 10, 10 days. Uh, I have mentored two people in the past, two, two mentorship programs at the same time then you really need to make sure that you actually can do that, that you can have the time, because it's fairly exhausting to do too. Um, and what is very important for most of these programs is to find a really good project for the application period. I'll come into more detail about that a bit later. Mentoring itself, it's important not to lower your standards. So you are uh, this is the Linux kernel. There are a lot of coding styles and, and best practices. And one of the jobs, I think at least as a mentor, is to communicate that to the intern, that they learn that. They get really good. I love to see how the coding skills improve from when they start to when they finish. Because the kernel is so strict. Uh, it, it's really, really nice to see that. Um, and of course, you always have to explain why things are done. So you shouldn't just say, do this. No, why is it done? There are always good reasons for it. And I think that is very helpful. Um, avoid the temptation to do the work yourself. So the intern is stuck and you think, oh, I can do that. I know exactly how to do it. No, it's a learning experience, a teaching thing. So you can give hints or look at that driver, how it's done there and try to uh, help them ahead. But don't do it yourself because it defeats. Of course, you can do it much quicker, right? You've been doing it for many years. Um, what's the fun in that? Uh, code review is the scariest thing. Uh, now, I've been programming for 40 years. I've been contributing to the kernel for 21. I'm still scared when I receive a review of a patch of mine. Uh, I, I don't, if, it's, if it arrives in the evening, I often don't open it because I want to sleep. I do it the next morning, then I'm fine. And it's, it doesn't get much better. It's really, you know, you put your heart and soul into your patch and then someone else starts bashing it. Come on, it was good. Uh, so you really need to tell the intern, it's normal to be scared about that. It's just, a, uh, it's a difficult thing to get there, but um, and as I said, it's really great to see someone grow over a project like that. Very satisfying. Now, not everything is always going great. Now, I, I've had some bad experience, not without Ricci. Uh, but it's good to tell a little bit about what to do when things go wrong. Um, first of all, try to discover why. Might be lack of time, uh, might be lack of knowledge. Uh, can be many different reasons. Perhaps there are medical issues or personal issues that prevent it from, from being effective. You need to ask and if it's something you can help with, do so. Uh, sometimes more time is needed. 
So in my recent internship, you had finals, I had a vacation, that we just extended the internship a bit because they didn't go together. So we had a bit more time. Uh, it's very important, if things are not going well, to clearly communicate that, talk about it with the intern, that they're not surprised by it. They may not notice or realize that things aren't going well. Um, worst case, consider stopping the internship if there's no improvement. You know, in the end, you still have a project that you really would like to get done. And if everything gets stuck and there's no progress, then perhaps you should just stop. It's really something you want to avoid. Of course, it's really bad for both sides. It's really, really sad and problematic and painful. And my experience is what is critical to the success of your project is actually that initial project that you design for the application period. What I generally do, um, part of the project, that initial project, is to set up the development environment. So can they do that? And then have a project that is perhaps just a little bit of the task that they have to do in the actual outreachy project. Just little, little snippets, something simple, uh, and also something that they can build upon when they are actually selected and continue with the real project. But that way you can get a good um, feel for the capabilities, uh, especially about learning, right? They, they probably can code, but can they actually implement that in a completely new environment that they've never used before, have no knowledge about? Uh, so are they motivated enough and do they have the capabilities? And uh, so you really need to put, as my experience at least, really put some thoughts into that initial project. And if it all goes well, then you have a lot of fun in the next, uh, <laughs> in the next three months. So that's my perspective as a mentor. I can really recommend it if you have the time. It's fun to do. <coughs> Very satisfying. Okay. Um. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tehera and uh, today I'm so excited to talk about my uh, contribution to the Linux kernel, uh, specifically to Landlog as a part of my outreach uh, internship. Um, so uh, I will uh, take you to, through the journey of uh, starting to contributing to the Landlog. What was the problem and how did we solve it? But before everything, uh, we need to understand what is landlock. So if you've joined uh, the two talks uh, before has been done for the landlock. So uh, one was done by Gunter and the other was done by um, Mikhail. Um, uh, and they covered landlock very good, but like I'm just gonna give you a, um, like a short uh, description of what landlock is and how it works. So uh, simply put, uh, Landlog is a stackable Linux security module. So the purpose of Landlog is to enable uh, the unprivileged processes to limit their access to the uh, system resources. Uh, Landlog provides sandboxing and uh, sandboxing gives us the ability to mitigate the security impacts of bugs or uh, malicious behavior in the user space applications. So the main reason that Landlock is important is because Landlock provides a tool that can be integrated into the, any uh, Linux-based application uh, without the needs to have a wide range of uh, changes in the system. Um, so in order to understand how Landlock works, I just provided like a very, very simple uh, 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 example. So uh, first, you need to um, uh, you need to create a rule set. So in the left uh, figure, you can see that uh, we created a rule set attribute. So the rule set attributes uh, ha allows false system read actions and also like specific TCP connections. And uh, in the right figure, I uh, just created that rule set. So it shows that the all other actions will be denied. 
Um, and then when we created the rule set, we enforce the rule set. So the process that actually sand, a process can sandbox itself. And if this uh, land log restrict self um, system call is successful, then it means that the policy is enforced and the thread will be, and all other subsequent children processes would be sandboxed. Um, as I said before, um, Landlock, before ABI version 6, uh, Landlock was uh, provided the access control for file system and signals, but it lacked a mechanism to control the inner process communications like signals. So it means that a uh, sandbox process could connect to like uh, another uh, non-sandbox process through abstract Unix sockets, for example. Uh, so it was introduced, a, it, it, like it would leave us with a system vulnerability that could potentially be a provision, lead to a privilege escalation attack. Um, so the way that we addressed this issue was uh, through designing and developing a new feature that actually restricts the uh, IPC by adding a new fill to the uh, landlock rules of attributes. So if you, uh, so previously we had this uh, handled access FS and handled access net, which supports uh, the uh, rule set attribute for file systems and networking. And we introduced this dot scoped uh, field as well. And, uh, so if this is scoped is set, it means that it will um, uh, scope the access to outside resources. And as you can see, we provided that for the abstract Unix sockets and signals. Um, so in order to enforce uh, this um, uh, access control, we provided uh, six new uh, security hooks to landlock, two for uh, abstract Unix sockets and two for, uh, and four other for signal processing. Um, these, uh, the first uh, figure shows the two for the abstract Unix sockets. The first one is uh, Unix Stream Connect, which is supported for, uh, which is provided for the stream sockets and the Unix Mason is, uh, provides the security hook for the uh, datagram sockets. And uh, the two main important uh, security hooks for the signal scoping is also task kill and uh, file sensing IO task, which uh, the first one supports uh, system calls for uh, sending any types of signals. Um, Besides uh, the kernel changes that we made, uh, we also provided a very wide range of tests to ensure that actually this uh, security mechanism works. And if this scope field is not defined, then um, the processor won't face any limitations. And also, we uh, I uh, had uh, collaborated with the uh, uh, with the Linux uh, kernel community to ensure that these security features actually would enter the uh, Linux kernel. So in the first uh, one, in, in, in this QR code, you can see the, if you scan it, you can see the abstract Unix socket scoping patch. And in the second one, you can see the uh, signal scoping patch. So, uh, and hopefully both of these would be a part of the next version of uh, kernel, which would be 6.12. Um, so, uh, during the internship, we faced a lot of different challenges, but one of the main challenges that we faced was the ensuring that these hooks actually were, imp were implemented correctly and could cover all the different scenarios. So, for example, in the case of abstract Unix sockets, a socket could be uh, like shared among different processes, a socket uh, could be created by a process and then passed to another process. So there, uh, so, uh, or the a socket could be sandbox, uh, and a socket could create a, so uh, a process could create a socket and then be, be sandbox. So we have a wide range of different scenarios that we need to cover it uh, with the, um, with different uh, uh, tests. So in order to overcome this challenge, uh, we uh, develop a, uh, a, a set of comprehensive uh, kernel self-tests. 
Um, so in total, we provided uh, seven different test scenarios for abstract ionic sockets and five different test cases for the uh, signal scoping. And you can see the different uh, tests in here. So uh, if I just wanted to uh, summarize the whole impact of my contributions, I can, say, I can mention uh, that as a four different things, the contribution to the main part of the kernel, uh, the, the kernel self-test that we provided, also we updated the documents of uh, kernel document and we um, uh, provided a, a usage example so it could be used by another developer. Um, and overall, uh, we improved the security of kernel. So I want to um, actually uh, use this stage and thanks, uh, thank the outreach organization. And also I wanted to especially thank my, thank my um, uh, mentors, Mikhail and Paul who invested a lot of their time and effort in me and I'm so grateful for all the uh, efforts that they put. And uh, also all other pe mem members of the Kernel uh, Linux community, especially Gunter who's here with me. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your uh, attention. Okay, so the next speaker is by video, so it will take me just one second to set that up. Hi everyone, I am Khadija Kamran and I am from Pakistan. I am a software engineer and I graduated in 2020 and for the past four years I have been developing software applications. Currently I am working as a full stack developer at a UAE based startup. I am an ex OutTG intern from May 2023 to August 2023 and today I will present my internship project analyzing Linux kernel security subsystem. I will be sharing my experience from being a complete beginner to becoming a Linux kernel developer. Let's begin by understanding security subsystems and Linux security modules. Security subsystems are security extensions that are integrated into the kernel to enhance the security of the entire system. Security subsystem enforce access control they regulate who can access specific system resources and what kind of actions they can perform. They mediate the system calls and they mitigate vulnerabilities. One of the key Linux security subsystems are Linux security modules. And Linux security modules provide frameworks that apply security policies within the Linux kernel. These LSM frameworks are implemented using LSM hooks and these LSM hooks are in the form of functions. When we look inside these LSM hook functions, we identify the scope, features, and functionality of different LSM frameworks. LSM frameworks that I worked on during my internship include SE Linux, App Armor, Smack, and Common Cap. Now let's talk about my journey from being a complete beginner to becoming a Linux kernel developer. So when I started this internship, I was a complete beginner in Linux kernel development. With such a vast code base, finding a place to contribute was quite overwhelming. The first month of my internship was all about learning the basics, studying about the security system, and basically asking very beginner level dumb questions. During this time, I am very grateful to my mentors for being patient with me. They encouraged me and they provided me with invaluable guidance. During this internship, the first significant step was when me and my mentors, we decided that my contributions should focus on enhancing and hardening LSM hubs, which are a critical part of enforcing security policies within the country. 
another key aspect i would like to mention from my internship was documentation from day 1 my mentors emphasized the importance of thorough documentation so i made it a point to document everything i documented every area i explored the contributions i made and i even documented the parts where i couldn't contribute to despite time i created detailed github wiki pages about my contribution and also explained the lsm hooks that couldn't be modified or enhanced i believe that this documentation will not only help future contributors but it will also add to someone's understanding of lsm hooks i have also added the link to these github pages at the end of the slide So let's talk about the contributions I made to the company. One of my first contribution was improving the documentation for LSM hooks. I noticed that several Linux kernel hooks they lacked comment blocks, so I added small comment sections to them. I studied the hook and wrote a brief description about the functionality and the input parameters of that function. These patches, I believe, would make it easier to understand, make LSM hooks easier to understand for future developers. In addition to documentation, I worked on impro improving the security of LSM hooks through constification. Now, constification is the process of hardening LSM hooks by changing their input parameters to read only. I identified such parameters in LSM hooks that were mutable, but they remain unchanged th throughout the function. including all the downstream calls so i made it these parameters constants here is an example from one of my patches to the kernel where i constify the file parameter in the security bprm threads from file lsm hub now this hook handles the credentials that are associated with the binary that is being executed this hook has implementation registered in common cap lsm and looking at the function implementation i observed that the file parameter is not changing so i marked the file parameter as const within the function moving further i would like to talk about overcoming my challenges my key learning experiences throughout my rpg internship So as a beginner I struggled with the fear of asking questions and making mistakes. It felt intimidating to contribute to something as complex as Linux kernel. But thankfully with the support of our PC program and my mentors I learned to ask for help and I gained the confidence to tackle these challenges head on. So this experience I became more comfortable with kernel development and I became more comfortable with contributing to open source. One of the biggest takeaways from this experience is that persistence is very crucial in open source. Secondly, it is very okay to ask questions and make mistakes. That is something that helps us grow. I also learned that contributions don't always have to be in the form of code, and documentation is just as valuable and can have a lasting impact. By the end of my internship I had submitted several patches that improved the security of LSM hooks and I'm proud to have made those contributions. In the end I would like to thank Outreach, the Linux Foundation and my mentors for this incredible opportunity. This internship helped me grow in several aspects and I'm incredibly grateful for the support I received. Thank you everyone for your time today and have a great day. Hi everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, yeah. So my name is Dorcas Litunya. I'm here to talk about my kernel internship where I was improving the support for the Vivid test driver. So first things first. I uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. It's 
south from here. I recently graduated as an electrical and electronics engineering from Jomo Kenyatta <laughs> University. I was a colonel intern between December 2023 to March 2024. I recently started at Microsoft as a software engineer. That was in August. And I love learning different things and working on different things. And I enjoy taking walks, but not in this Vienna weather, which is quite different from Nairobi. <laughs> yeah. So on to the work that I did. So I worked on Vivid. Vivid stands for the Virtual Video Test Driver. So the Virtual Video Test Driver is located in the media subsystem. So the media subsystem in the kernel supports cameras, TV tuners, media encoders, and decoders. Like anything media, that's what you work on. And so in the media subsystem, we have a unified framework that kind of defines any driver that is supposed to work on the kernel, how it should look like. And so we have that is called the V4L2 API, which is the video for Linux version 2 API. So that kind of outlines what needs to be done. So this framework provides a consistent way of allowing people to capture and process applications to interact with different media hardware. So it gives the framework to interact with hardware. And so this particular driver that I was working on, it emulates video for Linux hardware. So we were trying to emulate the connection of a HDMI cable, like when you physically, I had carried a HDMI cable all the way from Nairobi, but I forgot it. But I'm imagining you all know how a HDMI cable looks like. So what we are uh, particularly trying to do with this test driver was to emulate the physical connection of a HDMI cable on your laptop as an emulation software, and I'm going to talk about that. So the entire Vivid driver kind of tries to emulate all video for Linux hardware, including video capture, that would be video capture and output, radio, and even basic frame buffer for testing overlays. So what was the problem? So here we have a device here that is a video switcher. So with this video feature, what you can see, there are multiple plugs for HDMI. So this means that you could be able to connect uh, multiple video sources to monitors or recording uh, devices. So you have like, uh, if you have a video device that you want to connect different outputs here and still tap them out, sorry, different HD, yeah, different uh, HDMI signals here and still tap them, you can use this device. And so each input, each, each HDMI input can be routed to any output. So um, if you have a video camera and it has a HDMI signal that you connect here, if you want to tap that and connect it to your maybe monitor, you can be able to get any HDMI input and route it to any HDMI output. So this provides flexibility of how video feeds are displayed or, or recorded. And so with that, it means that you can be able to switch and distribute video across different devices. So you don't really need to think about if I'm connecting my HDMI output signal to HDMI one, will I be able, should I still tap it out from HDMI one? No, that means so long as it's inside this device, you can be able to tap it out from any of the uh, ports. So, what was happening in Vivid? So the virtual trust driver that we were emulating. So in Vivid, how we try to mimic a video device like that camera there, how we try to mimic it is you create an instance of that video device. So when you make a Vivid instance, what you're ideally doing is you're making a virtual version of a, of a video device. And so that, that virtual version has a configurable number of inputs or outputs. So you can define how that device is depending on the number of inputs or outputs that you have. And so it acts like a real video device and I've talked about that. So how Vivid was working before my internship was, it was not possible to connect the HDMI inputs and outputs of one instance to those of another. So if I had maybe a video device with three HDMI inputs and maybe a couple of outputs, I could not be able to connect it to another device. And that was an issue because that's not how real hardware works. And so you could only loop video from HDMI 
X output to HDMI X input within an instance. So you could only loop video within the same device, which was not how actual hardware works. So video from HDMI output can only be received on the HDMI one input. So yeah, as I said, that is not how hardware behaves. So the solution. So what we did first of all, we tried to reflect each inputs as control. So all the different inputs that a device could have were reflected as control here. So you can see that's a video device with two inputs and the instance is 002. So it's an instance of a HDMI video device with that. And then, yeah, so we re reflected all inputs as controls. Then the next thing that happened with is we are able to now outline all outputs across all instances. So this is basically showing all devices that you have configured across all different instances. So you could see 002 is the second instance of a video device, 003 is the third instance, and then 1, 2, 3, up till 12. Those are the number of outputs that we have for that device. So you can see um, instance 3 has 12 outputs and instance 2 has only sorry, 13, and instance two has only two, and then we have none when you don't want to connect your signal to anything and test pattern generator to just show that. So we were able to show outputs across instances. And through that, um, we were able to basically mimic devices. So to mimic exactly what that looks like. Like if I have this video device here, can I be able to see an exact replica of that? and an input device and an output device on my software. So that's basically what the project was about. And we were able to mimic the actual connection of a HDMI cable through that, through Vivid. Yeah, so my experience doing this, I learned a lot about the kernel and operating systems because first of all, because I was developing, I was basically turning hardware to software. It meant that I needed to understand first how that hardware works so that I can be able to make it very much well-defined. And it was also my first time contributing to the kernel just to get to know the basics and just to know how to do a patch, how to be able to uh, write quality code as Hans mentioned that the standards are not lowered for anyone just because you have just started out. Um, I understood a lot about writing clean code that is simple. Um, Hans normally says that writing simple code is very difficult. It's the most difficult part for being a programmer. And so I was able to write simple code that could directly mimic hardware as software. At first it was, we thought it was a simple task, but as we continued doing it, it was quite interesting. <laughs> I was able to improve my debugging skills because, uh, again, I did not know many tools uh, about the kernel, and Julia was very useful in providing that for me, and I got a lot of support from my mentors. So thank you, Hans and Johan, and thank you, Julia, for that. So thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. We're quite late, so please leave the room as quickly as possible.